everyone and hello Stephen. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest Genome Giants as we take a look at the lives and motivations of some of the most influential figures within the genomics field. Today we are joined by Stephen Kingsmore, a leader in clinical whole genome sequencing. So Stephen, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Hello everybody, I'm Stephen Kingsmore, as you've heard, and uh, I'm the president and CEO of Ready Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine. This is a new research institute which is focused exclusively on applying genomics to the care of children. And we live within one of the largest children's uh, healthcare systems in the US, Rady Children's Hospital. And we're located right on the border between the US and Mexico on the Pacific coast in beautiful San Diego. So Stephen, if we just kind of go back to where it all began. <laughs> okay, so you were born in, in Scotland. What are some of your kind of fondest memories growing up? Yes, I was born in Glasgow. I'm still a Rangers fan. And I realize I just alienated half of Scotsmen and Scotswoman, but that's okay. Uh, but my family moved to Northern Ireland when I was about four, four and a half. So I've really got no memories that date back to that time of Glasgow. I have a brother who lives there, and so I go back and see him once in a while. Um, but um, most of my memories relate to Belfast and then Coleraine, uh, and then finally Port Stewart, the three towns where my dad and mum lived and where I grew up. Uh, so I had a grammar school education, uh, went to university in Belfast, uh, and then emigrated to the U.S. at age 27. During the end of the Margaret Thatcher era, so I was one of those Thatcherite useless people because I was a, a scientist, a physician scientist of no possible value to society in her estimation. What was it kind of like growing up in, in, in Northern Ireland at, at that kind of, at that time? Well, it was the Troubles. Uh, it was the height of the Troubles, uh, which started in, I guess, 68, 67, 68. So I was seven or eight at the time. And it was, um, it was definitely not a normal upbringing. It was the only one I knew, but there was constant tension. There were bomb alerts, which scored us time off school, which was always good. Um, Coleraine itself, where I spent most of my childhood, uh, is right up in the northeast corner of Northern Ireland. It's well away from the border. And so there wasn't so much trouble there. But when I moved to Belfast then to go to medical school, boy, I was right in the middle of it. And it was, it was pretty hairy. Um, there were some upsides. You know, one was that the police did not really bother with speed limits. They had other things to deal with. And so you could drive like a bat out of hell. And this did not serve me well in life. It worked well in Northern Ireland. But when I came to the United States and was stopped by a police officer within about 24 hours of arrival, and of course, I had my stethoscope around my neck and I expected the usual, which is, you're going a bit fast today, sir. Uh, instead, I got a ticket. And um, I remember that lasting impact. <laughs> That's a really funny story. Um, what were you kind of like as like a child, like growing up? And, and when did you kind of just like start, like strike up like an interest within like science? Yeah, I was um, an introvert. I was um, a nerd from the get-go. I had a grandfather who actually was a, um, a general practitioner up in Lancashire, and um, he took a liking to me. And at age, I guess, nine or 10, he bought me a, a chemistry laboratory. Can you believe that? So we lived in a manse. My dad was a pastor, and we had one of these massive houses, with lots of rooms, none of which we could afford to heat. But uh, one of those got converted into a chemistry lab. And so uh, even in primary school, I was a, an amateur chemist. And when I got into grammar school at age 11, I started to you know, graduate to the types of chemicals you don't normally sell to an 11-year-old kid, you know, like concentrated nitric acid. Uh, and so I had to get scripts from my uh, chemistry teacher, which I could then take to our local pharmacy and buy these, these chemicals and go back to my, my lab. So that was the start. So that says something about what I was like back then. You had your, like, your own little lab going on? <laughs> I sure did. It was about, um, 
it was about fourth grade in, in so, so form four in grammar school before the rest of them caught up to me. Yeah, you said that you did your kind of like um, your degrees at the Uni Queen's University in Belfast. What was your kind of experience like here? And also, what did you study um, during your time here as well? Yeah, so um, I had wanted to go into medical school from a very young age. I, I wanted to be a surgeon. I wanted to be like um, um, a missionary surgeon, right? That was my idea. Um, fortunately for me, something wonderful happened uh, at my last year in grammar school. Um, so I was 17 and uh, I won a scholarship from Marks and Spencer's, if you can believe it. Uh, to go to the Weizmann Institute in Israel to a summer school. And that completely changed my, my life. I got to spend six weeks there and I actually worked with a tumor immunologist who was studying the impact of natural immunity on uh, cancer progression in mouse models, which at the time was bleeding edge. And to cut a long story short, I used to go there every summer for three months and do um, summer science project uh, and I got to publish that work and I would come back completely wiped out just exhausted from having stayed up all night you know doing the the research thing and then slug my way through medical school which was like the most boring thing on planet earth because all you did back then maybe it's still the same was just digest thick textbooks and be able to recite them you know it, it was just mind-numbingly boring and I'll never forget, I went into the Dean's office, I think the third time I was going back to see if I could get some sponsorship. And he looked me in the eye, this is Dean Roddy in Belfast, and he said, what are you gonna do over there, wash test tubes? So that was kind of the mindset in, in British medical schools back then, you know, that we were little revenue items being clicked along the path and had no brain. Uh, <laughs> and we're not to be encouraged to step outside the box. Yeah, I mean, you kind of then you went from kind of like Belfast and then you kind of moved moved abroad. Like what made you kind of want to leave kind of your hometown and, and us over here, I suppose? <laughs> well, I think for, for the younger generation, um, you don't remember how austere academia was back at that time in the Thatcher years. So um, universities were seen as an unnecessary luxury for Britain. And as a result, budgets were slashed. And um, universities were actually selling buildings to pay salaries. And so the idea of big science, which clearly now Britain is a global leader in, was, was a completely unfathomable concept. Uh, departments were just struggling to survive. So the mentors that I had at Belfast uh, said, go west, young man. You know, I wanted to do big science. I was used to the temple of the Weizmann Institute. And uh, tragically back then, there were really no avenues, um, at least provincial avenues to pursue that in the United Kingdom. Um, so I moved to the US. The other factor of course was that I fell in love uh, and wanted to get married. And I grew up Protestant and my wife Fiona grew up Catholic. And we had that sort of um, strange situation where we realized we were likely to get kneecapped, tarred and feathered and firebombed should we stay in Northern Ireland. And that didn't seem like the best way to start a marriage. And so we also moved to the US, I guess, as religious refugees. Is there anything that you kind of miss from kind of Northern Ireland? Oh yeah, there's a ton. I was actually back last week. So tragically, my father-in-law died uh, just a week ago. My wife and I had to drop everything and get flights. I got to tell you, flying internationally during COVID is quite an experience. Uh, we could go into that for an hour. But anyway, I was over there a week ago, so I got my Irish breakfast, or British <laughs> breakfast or English breakfast, whatever you want to call it. But the one with all kinds of things on it that you can't really buy anywhere else in the world. They're probably not even classified as foods, uh, which are quite delicious. So yes, I definitely miss that. I also got a good fix of watching Chelsea uh, in the, I guess it was the Champions Cup. Yeah. So yes, there's a lot of stuff that you just don't get to do or participate in as an expat Brit. 
you did your your residency and, and your fellowship um, at Duke kind of university what was your what was your time like here and how did that kind of compare to your experience in, at Bel in Belfast yeah I had been waiting for a green card for three years and so I had been drifting around in the National Health Service kind of just waiting uh, to get the green card and so I, I hadn't got a well thought through career progression uh, I mean I'm a 23 year old guy okay what guy who's 23 has any thought other than let's not go there um, <laughs> so anyway I, we, we arrived in the states I flew over in December to interview my interview lasted all of about 17 seconds I was ushered into the um, the chair of medicine's office a guy called Joe Greenfield with blazing blue eyes he had those half glasses that kind of sat on his nose like this. And he's looking at my resume and he's looking at my resume. He's looking at my resume. And he looks up over the top of his glasses. He fixes me with his glacial stare for a full 15 seconds. Doesn't blink, he goes, you'll do. That was it. Uh, so I, I arrived there not really knowing um, how great was my landing spot. And uh, I was six years at Duke, and they really, th that's where I got the ability to think. And Duke back then, probably still is, was famous for having taken the Hopkins mantra, which is evidence-based medicine. Show me the data. You're not allowed to go home until I've diagnosed you. And this was a, a huge difference from the National Health Service approach, which was much more functional when you're functionally better, we need to get you out. We're trying to minimize your stay, minimize our costs. In the US, it was the opposite. It was, we have a problem until we have data and have solved the underpinning problem. The fact that you're getting better is awesome, but we're not satisfied. And um, that was mind changing and life changing. Did you find like there was a kind of like a culture shock that when you kind of went from kind of Belfast to, to America? Oh, yes. They couldn't understand a word I said. <laughs> and I couldn't understand a word they said. You know, two people with separated by a common language. I had to learn a whole new vocabulary. And, you know, bear in mind that um, Durham, North Carolina is predominantly African American. So, so Southern US, Southeastern US, African American. And so they have their own real strong draw and a whole vocabulary, it's kind of like Cockney, a whole vocabulary of words um, that as you know, a young Northern Ireland guy had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and so, yes, um, there was huge culture shock. You know, I'd never seen a baseball game in my life. Duke happened to be the best college basketball uh, team uh, in the world back then. And uh, I'd never seen basketball. Uh, I took my father-in-law to his first American football game and uh, we were sitting in the stands and at the end of the game, the fans invaded the pitch, tore up the posts and then marched off down to the local bar. And my father-in-law looks at me and he goes, they're quite animated. Is it always like that? Um, so yeah, huge culture shock, but in, a, in an awesome way. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you kind of get into all the kind of different sports that are over there and I, um, like become like like a fan of the different the clubs over there as well, I suppose. But what was your things, kind of... Go. Things are much more homogenized now. Yeah. I mean, all of the fast foods I used to yearn for are now ubiquitous in Great Britain. And I lament the fact that we have globalization and we've lost that individuality. And yes, on Sky TV, you can watch every football game, you American football game you want, stream them all day and all night. It, it's in some ways regrettable, but it, it does mean if I go back, I don't miss out on sports. Yeah. What was your kind of early career like and, and what kind of challenges, if any, did you, did you face during that time? I arrived at a very propitious moment. It was 1987. And the field of molecular genetics had just been born, right? So we were able for the very first time to sequence genes. We did so in very short stretches of about 150 nucleotides. We used gels, it was Fred Sanger's method with P32. 
we were able to use restriction fragment length polymorphisms and add southern's southern blots to build genetic maps and that was it uh, we were starting a brand new field using molecular tools in genetics never been done before hitherto uh, genetics had been you know the stuff of, of mendel it had been a, a qualitative science or quantitative only in terms of breeding experiments. Uh, so an amazing time to jump into that uh, and start to think through, boy, we could actually clone a disease gene. Can you imagine? Wow, how powerful would that be? And it might only take five years. You know, so it was, it was a wonderful time to jump into this emerging field uh, and everything you did was new. Yeah. You served as the, the CEO and, and president of the National Centre for, for Genome Resources. How did this kind of this role come about and, and what was your kind of what did your role entail as well? Yeah. I, uh, so I had been uh, in academia, loved it, was successful and unfortunately got really bored uh, and wanted a new challenge. And at the time, the first genomic revolution was happening when there were genomic companies. Who would have thought these companies were springing up to billion dollar valuations uh, with no product, uh, no revenue, but just the promise of genomics doing stuff. And I find that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't not do that. So I jumped up to New Haven, Connecticut and became the VP of research at Curigen Corporation. Uh, so I'd been in that life then, going back to NCGR, which is a little research institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, for about 10 years, and I wanted to get back out of that. I got tired of that um, commercial biotech life, you know, living quarter to quarter uh, on earning statements, and um, didn't fit, just didn't fit academia, because, you know, biotech puts its imprint on you, and you're used to highly engineered solutions. And I was very fortunate to land at NCGR. Now, they are the organization, nobody knows this, but they spun off a company called Molecular Informatics, which became Solera. So if you, if you remember back to then, Solera went from an idea with Craig Venter to a fully-fledged organization. Well, that's because they bought what was NCGR. Um, so I arrived after the no-compete, they could get back into genomics. And I arrived there right at the time that Jonathan Rothberg produced the first uh, next generation sequencing platform, the 454 technology. And I had been working with Jonathan at Curigen. I knew those guys really well. And we took that organization, which was a bioinformatics research institute. Again, what is that uh, back then? And we completely flipped it so that it built the formative software systems for handling next generation sequencing. And we had a sea of fun, uh, and in particular in agric agricultural biotechnology applications, doing things like cDNA libraries, so, so expression analysis of all kinds of important crops to uh, fundamental uh, decoding genomes, all of that stuff. It was, again, a marvelously rich time. How did you then go from that kind of that role to your role at um, Mercy, Mercy Hospital and kind of working in the pediatric genomic medicine? Center. Well, we were all sitting around in a conference room, you know, having one of those brainstorming sessions and collectively a group of us realized this is going to completely transform medicine. You know, what we can do in maize or, you know, some pathogen we're going to be able to do for the human genome. Uh, if we're going to do that, we can't be, you know, in a beautiful spot in New Mexico, we got to be inside a hospital. You got to have patient access. You got to have medical record access. Hey, let's go do that. So three of us left uh, NCGR and moved to Children's Mercy Hospital, uh, who were foolish enough to bankroll our crazy idea. And we had a foundational uh, project. We had some entrepreneurs who uh, were keen for us to build the world's first carrier screening test. Uh, one of them was a dad who tragically had a child with Batten disease, a recessive genetic disorder with a bad prognosis. 
And the idea was a very simple one. If we could test couples prior to conception, we could avoid genetic disease. Well, the idea was flawed. Number one, there are major ethical obstacles. Number two, the bulk of genetic disease is actually dominant, not recessive, and de novo, not inherited. Nobody knew that back then, but that project was our entree then to getting into mainstream medical problems. And so we wound up in a children's hospital and realized we were surrounded by kids with single locus genetic diseases who had no good options. What was your kind of greatest uh, achievement during that time? And what did you kind of learn during that kind of experience? Well, the nice thing was um, we were applying these biotechnology lessons. So we were able to set up a little company inside a hospital with some kind of hierarchical structure and team spirit, the idea of multidisciplinary teams. So probably pulling that off was the greatest accomplishment because it allowed us to do things that were only being done at other such organizations like the Broad Institute. And so, yes, we were in a children's hospital, but we had this unique structure. So that was the trick. Uh, in terms of practical accomplishment, uh, th that's a really easy one. In 2011, we uh, decided, uh, with the help of Illumina, to actually think about how fast we could decode a human genome. And we were able to do it in 48 hours. And that was, that was sort of, I, I remember it vividly. Uh, it was in October. It was leading into the general election. Uh, in the US and um, it was the night before a presidential debate and uh, we were on the front page of the New York Times and we had no idea what the impact of that would be but it was a revolutionary idea which was if you can decode a genome in a day you have a tool that's ready for inpatient management a practical management tool as opposed to what had been happening before which was it took months to decode a single genome. And so honestly, its clinical relevance was only marginal. It was used for chronic conditions where you needed a, a diagnostic label. But instead, now we were able to open up into intensive care unit settings with critically ill children. You're now, uh, obviously, as your background suggests, the, the president and CEO of Rady's Children um, kind of Institute. And what has it been like for you, I suppose, kind of watching technology advance and how has that impacted your impacted your work? I was incredibly blessed to, to uh, wind up at Rady Children's Hospital. So Ernest Rady is this incredible uh, Canadian billionaire um, who's decided he wants to give you know the vast majority of his money away before he dies. And so the hospital approached him and said, we, we think we need a, a genomics center. Uh, would you please consider giving us $20 million? And, you know, this discussion went on for a period and a business plan was evolved. And at the end of it, Ernest said to them, you think you're thinking far too small. I'll give you $120 million as long as you'll match it with 40. So this was the Institute. And you've got to remember that um, uh, San Diego is kind of unique. You know, in the U.S., we kind of have three hubs for biotechnology, we've got Boston, the Bay Area, and San Diego. We have 800 biotech companies in, uh, in San Diego. In the region, you know, Thermo Fisher is headquartered. Illumina is headquartered. Um, so we have this amazing hospital embedded within what's being called the genomics capital of the world. And so we had this amazing opportunity to do something that had never been done before create an institute from scratch post the year 2000 with all of the lessons learned based on the genomics industry in the hub, the world hub for such activity. Um, so it's been a whirlwind over the last six years. What has the kind of, what's it kind of like for you kind of working in that kind of setting? Because I suppose that you kind of, you see kind of firsthand the impact that genomics is having on, on patient lives. So what's that kind of been like for you kind of see, seeing that essentially? It's hugely motivating. Uh, every week we, in all likelihood, have saved a child's life. 
we now have, believe it or not, 69 children's hospitals all across North America, so US and Canada, who send us uh, a small blood sample and uh, a copy of the medical record, or at least part of it. Um, and these are all kids who are critically ill in intensive care units. And, um, you know, one in three, we diagnose with a genetic disease. Two and three, we kind of rule out the genetic diseases that we're, we're worried about, at least we change the posterior probability that they have those. And so 90% of the time that information has impact on management. And sometimes, like the case we published yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine, it saves a life. It's just like, boom, that was a little baby with an encephalopathy. We diagnosed him within 13 and a half hours. He was on the right treatment, which was biotin and thiamine supplements, within three hours of us communicating the diagnosis. Yeah, I mean... And uh, we saved his life. What are the kind of what are the kind of kind of research that that you guys are kind of focused on trying to kind of Im improve this area of diagnosis? A um, couple of things. So first of all, we're trying to do this at scale. You know, our vision is not for this to be for the rich few or the few who are, are lucky enough to be in leading academic centers. It's how do we change pediatric practice? How do we make this true for every child, um, at, at least in, in the first world? and in some form factor in the second and third world. Um, and so we're thinking always about scalability, scalability, scalability. So how do we drop the cost? How do we improve the turnaround time? How do we make this scalable? And we're getting there. So it's realistic now to think about testing every child with an unknown um, etiology of disease who's admitted to a hospital. That's occurring right now in Wales. It's going to happen soon in England. It's happening increasingly in Australia. And we're doing our best to have that happen in the US. We're also able to think about other uh, systems, like for example, decoding the genome of every newborn as newborn screening. These are things which are gonna be happening over the next five years. So right now for us, it's all about scale, scale and more scale. It's not so much about, we need bleeding edge technologies. No, the technologies we have are awesome. What we now need to do is to educate and engage the entire healthcare workforce so that they're able to catch back up and do this for their local community. That's the big gap now is number one, the evidence so that the commercial payors will reimburse this to make it scalable. And second of all, that we educate practical frontline physicians, nurses, social workers, genetic counselors, and so on and so on so that they can practice this routinely as opposed to being scared to death of it. What do you kind of think will need to be done to increase the accessibility of these technologies? Because obviously, as you said, that is being done in the United States and then over here in the UK and Australia. But how are we going to ensure that there's access for kind of other countries? For other countries, um, it's a matter of education and engagement. So right now we are focused pretty strongly on South America because we're right on the border with, with Mexico. Um, and so Brazil is a great case in point. There are a number of groups there who want to adopt what we are doing in the Brazilian healthcare system. And so the form factor will look different, but the intent and the deliverable will be as similar as possible. And so it's all about education and engagement and influencing and then getting alongside them and saying, here's all of our protocols, here's all our methods, here's the phone number of the guy at Illumina, tell them I told them to call you, free reagents for the first six months, <laughs> da da da. Uh, and it's happening. You know, we just had our, we have a conference once a year, it's called Frontiers in Genomic Medicine. We now do it in three languages. We do it in English, obviously. We do it in Spanish and we do it in Portuguese. Why? Because there's that huge South American population poised. Their healthcare system's ready for this. Well, as ready as the US healthcare system is, they just need some help to get it off the ground. Other parts of the world are not so much on target for us and are catching themselves up, you know, whether it's uh, the Middle East. Who are right there. We have a, um, a good relationship with, with Israel, 
who are now doing their, uh, what's it called, Baby, oh, Baby Bambi. Baby Bambi is their exploratory project to prove out for the Israeli system that what we're doing in intensive care units works in their system. So it's happening all over the world and it's really exciting to participate in it. What do you think some of the kind of challenges are in terms of trying to kind of get um, whole genome sequencing um, more like into mainstream clinical practice um, and also to try and kind of reduce that time to diagnosis for, for patients? As I said, um, technologically we're there, okay? We have a 13 and a half hour method, which is off the, pretty much off the shelf. Um, so the methods are there. Um, they still are costly. Basically, you have a choice. You can do a genome for about $500, or you can do a genome in, you know, less than a day. The price point is completely different. Um, and one is regulated and clinical and the other is research. So cost in clinical settings is still, it's still a big number. Um, but having said that, it's, it's certainly less than a day in an intensive care unit for a patient. And typically by diagnosing a patient, you save multiple days in hospital because a large part of being in an intensive care unit is getting to the etiology. You really need to fix the etiology to deliver a critically ill child from that illness to, to health. Um, so the, the cost effectiveness needs a bit more evidence but we now have study after study. Just this morning, uh, we published in the American Journal of Human Genetics the results of Project Baby Bear, where we showed that in the US system, you will save $20,000 per day if you do a three-day genome within 96 hours of admission. And that's in Medicaid babies. That's babies whose insurance bill is paid for by the government. That's about 55% of US admissions to intensive care units. So, so that piece is happening. The big bit is education and engagement. And this is all the way from policymakers through the insurance companies, through C-suites of hospitals and chief medical officers, through uh, uh, leaders of divisions like neonatology and uh, intensive care medicine, all the way through uh, frontline physicians. Are there any sort of challenges in terms of like, obviously, as you said, like you think we have we have the technology, but what about in terms of kind of like variant interpretation and that kind of area? Because obviously, once you get the sequence, you have to find kind of where the, the variant or something is. And how is that kind of being um, explored and any, any challenges in that kind of area? There are, but people get themselves all twisted up on this. Whenever you have a marvelous new technology, you don't expect it to be perfect out of the box. You know, you take what it can do and you do it and you scale it to population scale and you don't lament the fact of what it can't do, right? So, so I know a lot of my colleagues get all twisted in their head about variants of uncertain significance, genes of uncertain significance, negative findings, uh, incidental findings. It's like, grow up guys, okay? That's 5%, it's probably less than 5%. Why don't we focus on scaling the 95% where it does work today? And you know what? It gets better every year. We tackle little pieces of the 5% where the technology is not scalable today, a little bit at a time. So let's focus on what works and scaling that rather than focusing on what doesn't work. Yeah. You hold the kind of Guinness world record for achieving the fastest molecular kind of diagnosis using whole genome sequencing. What was it kind of like to achieve that for you, essentially? It was super fun. Uh, we've done it twice now and we tried to do it a third time. And the Guinness guys said, no, we're kind of sick of doing your world records, you know, go do something else. Uh, so the last time they, I, I swear, the last time they said, we don't want to give you a third one because we just broke the record um, last October. It's now 13 and a half hours. So now that it's published, maybe we'll go back to Guinness and say, come on guys, you know? Anyway, it was a lot of fun. So first of all, I grew up in Northern Ireland, so I like Guinness. So that whole aspect had a certain, you know, that works. Um, 
And then the whole thing, the pageantry of it is kind of like mystical, right? So this guy flows in, he's got this smile that's like four yards wide, you know, and his special suit and his little presentation thing. You know, if you grew up in Northern, if you grew up in the UK back when I did, it was the McWhorter twins, if you remember those guys. Well, they still have guys like that. And you fly them, they fly in, they present it to you and all this. It's actually really exacting. It's a pain to actually meet the criteria. We had to set up video cameras all night long to video the sequencer, for example. We needed proctors on site all night long to witness that nobody was like wandering into the lab and swapping out the sample. So anyway, it, it's a lot of fun and it's very cool. And why we do it, so, you know, scientists, again, sometimes forget who pays their bills. It's the public. And there's this huge need to excite the public about what we do. And so something like a Guinness World Record, people get that, right? They have no idea what we actually did, but it's a Guinness World Record. That's very cool. Talk to me about that. So it's opened up a lot of doors with mainstream media and hopefully influenced a lot of people because ultimately it's parents who make decisions for their children. And the day to talk to them about a genome sequence for their baby is not the day you meet them in the intensive care unit. It's to have them pre-aware that a genome is good, you know? Do you think there will kind of be a time where um, a child is born and then the parent will be told, okay, you're going to have your child's genome genome sequence it, sequence whether they have something wrong with them or or not. And do you think that should should be done? And what are the kind of ethical uh, kind of like issues surrounding that as well? Yeah, that that ship has sailed actually. So for sixty years uh, in many countries, maybe nearly all countries, we screen babies at birth for genetic conditions. Um, and it's mandated by law. Um, so that, that ship sailed many, many years ago. Um, it's just that we don't do it by genome sequencing. We do it typically by a battery of tests, the best well known as mass spectrometry for metabolic conditions. But now we also do it for, for deafness disorders uh, and for other things, for uh, congenital heart disease, for... Um, T cell circle excision, ex T cell excision circles. So we do it. It's just a matter of scale. You know, up until now, we've been able to do it for somewhere between 20 conditions and 70 conditions, depending on where you're born. With yeah. genomes, we can take that number up to 600 or so. And the, the criteria will be identical. You're only going to do it if it's a really bad disease that has a really effective treatment right? Uh, and in which a delay where you navigate the normal, well, you get sick and then you see a doctor and then you advance and you get it up where you don't have time for that, where you'd have organ damage such that that would be wrong. So it's a very special set of conditions, but with genomes, we can take that number up to about 600. So will it happen? Yes, it's definitely going to happen. Pilots are being planned of this in several healthcare systems. Is it fraught with, with uh, ethical and, and legal issues? It is, yes, because newborn screening traditionally had a waiver. You don't go ask a mom's permission to do a heel prick on their baby. And so we have to ask ourselves as a society, if we're gonna broaden this from 20 or so conditions to 600 or so conditions, what's the framework for that? And as, as societies, we will need to make those, those decisions about what we're comfortable with. And we probably will be quite disparate across the entire planet in how we think that through. Um, but the, the actual thing itself, it's somewhat mundane and it's really well shown that this saves lives um, uh, without noise, much noise around the background, uh, other than that people do screen positive and then turn out not to have the condition. And so you do have those weeks of uncertainty where you've screened positive and you have not yet had a negative test. So we do have that to overcome. Um, but other than that, I mean, yes, 
um, the issues are much more about technological maturity and when will this be well enough baked to actually have that be realistic. It's going to take several years. Yeah. I saw you um, speak at um, the Frontiers in, in, in Pediatric Genomic Medicine recently, and you said something about how in the future we'll kind of stop talking about the diagnostic odyssey and it will be more about the kind of therapeutic odyssey and that obviously from time to diagnosis is there kind of like a treatment available. What do you think needs to be kind of considered in this area and done? Because obviously we're going to get to a point where we're really good at diagnosing, but then there's no treatments or anything like that. Yeah, so I mean, if you're a pathologist and, and I started out life as a pathologist, you're hung up on uh, diagnosis. If you're a regular physician, a treating physician, uh, you're hung up on treatment, you're hung up on outcome, you're hung up on symptomatology. And in this journey, the diagnosis, it's important, but it, it ain't the end. And so people talk about ending the diagnostic odyssey, and I get that. And it's really important, but it's not an end. So ending the diagnostic odyssey doesn't end the odyssey. It ends a step in the odyssey, which was we were stuck without a diagnosis. Next is for 90% tragically, we're stuck without an effective treatment. We have a diagnosis, that journey is over. But tragically, there's not an effective therapy now being deployed in my newly diagnosed baby. We've got to fix that. Um, and it's gonna be a sea change because right now we, we regard diagnosis as this like holy grail thing, right? You know, it's mystical and beautiful. And we gotta kind of go, it's not actually, it's an intermediate step in the practice of medicine. And we gotta demystify that. Like I said, Let's get over ourselves on genes and variants of uncertain significance because the diagnosis is not the end. We've got to push through and say every child deserves uh, a trial of therapy. And how do we engineer now that that diagnostic interim step is a qualifier for a clinical study of treatment? Yeah. What is kind of next for Radio? Kind of what are you working on and hoping to do in, in the future as well? We want to make uh, intensive care unit rapid genomes normative in the US. So that's number one. And our board uh, and our hospital have committed to funding us to decode 10,000 babies' genomes in order to make that a reality. And so, as I said, scale, scale, scale. Um, so that's a huge component. But the other component is what I just addressed, which is 90% of these babies who we diagnose, we don't immediately move them into life-saving treatments. Oh my goodness, I can't sleep knowing that. We've got to fix that. We are entering a new world where we can make a genetic therapy for one patient in less than a year. So we are now entering this new era of customized, individualized genetic therapies. That's the future for us. Uh, let's jump into that. Let's think that through and let's figure out how to do that in industrial scale. So every child we diagnose moves into that next phase. That's the next big thing. Well, like kind of genomic medicine as a whole, how do you kind of see this field like evolving in the next few decades? And, and what, I mean, what could you like predict if you had to, how this field will, will, will change? Last 30 years or so have identified over, so my, during my career, we've identified over 6,000 new genetic diseases. We know their molecular basis. The next 30 years, we'll have 6,000 treatments for those 6,000 genetic diseases. That's what's going to be true. And we will look back on the current era where we were hung up on diagnosis and then didn't have treatments and go, that's kind of like how we used to treat infections before um, Sir Ian Fleming discovered penicillin. You know, we, we, we could diagnose it uh, and then the patient died of sepsis. Um, we're gonna do the same. It'll be before and after the management of sepsis with and without broad spectrum effective antibiotics. 
I mean, if we kind of just go back back to your career and you kind of look back, are there any kind of missteps in your career that you feel like have kind of shaped uh, like mm. your career now to this day? Oh, yes. I remember uh, interviewing for the ready job and the then CEO of the hospital, uh, Donald Karen, said to me, you know, Kingsmore, you're pretty impressive, but um, what, why, why should we hire you? And I looked him in the eye and I said, well, I've screwed it up enough times in enough places and of the scars that I know what not to do. And they hired me. <laughs> and so, yes, um, you know, in life, we regard missteps sometimes as bad. And I actually think missteps are fine. That's the only way you learn. Well, it's one of the only ways you learn. You can learn from other people's missteps. Uh, but but that's the thing is to say, wow, I was blessed with something that didn't work out. What have I learned from that? How will that never happen again to me, to my team, to my organization? How do we use this to beat? Because the enemy, the enemy is not success and failure. The enemy is these kids who need tr effective treatments. Yeah. What would you kind of say to someone who's kind of starting early in their career? Uh, data science is this extremely exciting new field. Uh, I still am not sure how to define it, but it's kind of like an elephant. When you see one, you know that it's an elephant. Uh, so, so that's really exciting, this idea that we will be able to use massive amounts of data to have novel predictive insights in medicine. We've never been able to do that before. Medicine has always been seat of the pants, but for the very first time, we're going to be able to have massive data sets that start to allow us to predict trajectories. Uh, and the public health implications are profound. And that's a field that's the way molecular genetics was back in the late 80s. Yeah, the late 80s. Uh, it's brand new. And uh, we don't have too many clear cut examples of how that's gonna transform healthcare, but it will. Uh, and so jump on in, but make sure you know how to program. Are there any people kind of throughout your, your career that you've felt have kind of helped you along your way that kind of like are notable in your, in your mind? Oh yes, always I think um, without mentors, without colleagues, without coworkers, um, you, can't, you can't be uh, successful. You know, you're interviewing me as a giant. Well, I'm not a giant in any manner. Uh, the only thing I can do is hopefully get a group of people around me and excite them about an idea. It's them who do all the stuff, you know? It's them who have all the insights. It's them who slug through all of the intermediate steps. Um, and then you interview me as a giant, you know? So yes, um, we believe in multidisciplinary team-based work. Uh, my role is not to have a big head. It's to realize that, yes, they call me boss, but honestly, you know, they call me boss kind of as a, as a label. Uh, I'm there to help them. I'm help to, there to incentivize them. But yes, throughout my life, I've been very fortunate to have had these people who somehow see me as a leader, and go, let's do this together. Uh, and it's all about them. And for me as a Christian, it's all about God. It's all about him. He's the guy who's got the smarts, right? And this is something that in our Western world, we de-emphasize, which is the spiritual element behind creativity. And for me, it's the essence of all creativity is, is that spiritual element. Um, How do you feel like you're kind of, kind of spiritual beliefs and um, kind of combine with, with the kind of science and how do you kind of deal with that kind of day to day? Well, as a CEO, I got to be very careful, okay? I can't proselytize. Um, that's no longer like kosher. Um, so I have to be very, very careful that I can only do that when somebody like you asks me a direct question and then I'm allowed to answer it honestly, uh, but I'm not allowed to really bring it up. And especially with people who report to me, I have to be incredibly careful to make sure that I'm not trying to, to do anything that, that might be uh, considered um, pressurizing, right? 
um, and that, that gets to be frustrating, but it's just life. Um, but um, it's huge. Every good idea I get, like in the middle of the night uh, or in the shower, you know, it's just, it, boom. Whoa, that is really smart. Where did you come up with that, right? Uh, it's, it's this serendipitous thing. And, you know, I'm 60 going on 61. I've learned to cultivate that. I've learned to actually, it's going to freak some people out. I talk to God all the time. I mean, 24-7. He talks back. And we have the best chats. Understand, he created everything, right? So it's like CRISPR. Dude, I created CRISPR. You know, what you guys don't know about CRISPR would floor you. Why don't you ask me? Huh? Why don't you ask me? I could share a few tips with you. This happens all the time. Um, and, and so um, I'm fortunate that then I have some people around me who get comfortable with that, right? And they go, it, it's Kingsmore, you know? And some of them have the same belief system as me. And some of them just go, no, nah, he doesn't. You know, he's, he's that, but they put up with it. Uh, and so I'm very fortunate that I have people, even board members, who go, I'm not sure how the sausage gets made, but I like the flavor of the sausage. So just do it. Don't tell us how you do it. Just, just do it. Outside of your, your, your career, what do you kind of like to do in, in your spare time? Like what kind of other interests do you have other than obviously genomics? <laughs> Okay, I got to tell you, all of those of you who are young and want to be a giant, you don't have time, okay? You've got time to do your busy work. And then sometimes in the middle of the night, like this morning between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., I get to do work. That's for me. It's my research. Um, so what do I do outside work? I sleep. I sleep. I like to drink beer. Uh, I'm an avid runner, and that's really necessary. That gives you that whole tempo thing. And I like long distance running, right? So I just, whenever I was over in Northern Ireland, I managed to run 100 miles. Whew. You know what? Britain had the coldest May, I think, ever. It was like unbelievably cold. Ridiculous. Made me realize why I like to live in San Diego. Anyway, um, I have a very tolerant wife, and she's awesome, and she insists that we do stuff other than work. And but for her, I probably would only just work. <laughs> yeah, no, we had a very terrible May over here. I don't know what was going on, but it wasn't summer. <laughs> <laughs> if you could turn your, your life and career into an autobiography or a film, what would you name that? What would the title be? Mm. You can have time to think about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something about grace or faith. Yeah. Um, uh, clearly, um, I believe I've been blessed. I believe I'm responsible for a series of events where people have either, you know, done good stuff for me, like my grandpa giving me a, a laboratory, age 10, uh, all the way through Marks and Spencers. <laughs> um, and I'm a very avid Marks and Spencer's shopper and always will be because of that. You know, so a lot of people invest uh, and, and God has been sent. So it's all about grace and faith. And, you know, we're still in, in a very nutty pandemic world. And for research institutes, it's a crazy season. And we're figuring out how to work virtually. And grace and faith have come to the, the forefront again with everybody we encounter and every deadline, we got to have grace and patience with one another. So, so those are two great words. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to me today, Stephen. It's been, it's been really, really Pleasure. great talking to you. And I still think you're a giant, whether you think you are or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep up the really, really good work that you're doing at Radio as well. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Hello everyone, if you enjoyed this video then make sure you check out some of the other videos in our series by subscribing below or going to our website for onlinegenomics.com. I hope you enjoy.